Hello, in this video we're going to be covering some postpartum mood disorders. So first, we're going to talk about postpartum depression. Alright, so first up we got to talk about our rates. So just the standard mom coming in, having a baby, um, still has about a 20% prevalence. Now if we are in the NICU, so we got a baby that's admitted to the NICU, that number goes up to about 70%. So definitely a big increase, and there's a lot of things that can come into play with this. So some of our risk factors are uh, pre-existing disorders. So anything pre-existing. And one of the things that they like to ask is kind of like a question that you might see is what is the most common mental health disorder during pregnancy um, that actually is anxiety because you're pregnant you don't know what's going on you don't know what to expect you're worried and after that then you can lead into some depressive symptoms so depression so we talked about pre-existing conditions that's one of the ones um, that can make you high risk or make a mother high risk specifically mental health that's one of those big groups so where it's actually coming from it's a complex process and it involves biology It involves psychology. So it's it's definitely not like a straightforward thing. So we talked about the pre-existing conditions, mental health. Some of those biological symptoms or biological reasons can kind of come up here, cause you to have some little exacerbations, make things a little bit more worse. A um, couple other things would be lack of support. and being poor just low sociotic socioeconomic status but we're just going to write poor because that's easier for us to just write and remember so when does it happen so we talked to it's complex it has rates so when are we going to see this actually occur so a lot of it's just that first month after delivery so that's one of the big ones now let's get over to some of the tools that we have. So we have different type of assessment tools to do it. One is the postpartum depression screening. So postpartum depression screening is just one of the tools that you may see out there. But there is also a more severe form. So we have our depression, but it can also end up developing into what's called psychosis. So this is rare, um, and this is usually the two to third week. So the first two to three weeks of the baby's life. So you have a severe clinical um, presentation that often mimics a lot of the things that's going on with the postpartum depression. So peak onset of symptoms might be good to remember. So peak onset is about that 10 to 14 days mark after the delivery. And this includes things like sleep problems, delusions, hallucinations, um, irrational behaviors. And the moms really have a hard time distinguishing between what's real and what is part of delirium. So a um, very big problem if these mothers are experiencing these because you'll hear stories about uh, moms that do horrible things to their newborns or infants and everyone's like, wow, how, I, could, I could never do that. How could anyone let that happen? And it's like, well, this is not, they're not in the right state of mind. It's truly a psychosis and something that they should have or should be considered treatment for um, 
they're not in the right state of mind. They're not themselves. So definitely psychosis is one of the more serious ones, but again, postpartum depression is pretty common and something that we're going to watch out for. Now for treatment, we want to know what we can do. So simply psych therapy, uh, many of that cognitive therapy, they can talk to them, talk to psychiatry, work on their feelings, express their feelings, support groups are another big one that we'll do. Uh, and then you can turn to medications. Some of those are the SSRIs. Those are one that are really common as monotherapy. But there are issues when you're doing either of these routes. <clears throat> Simply non-compliance is always that big one. So we'll start treatment with somebody. We'll come up with a great plan. They're going to want to follow through with this, but then they end up not following through with it and we end up with some problems but there's also where we'll put the support groups so just group therapy are some things that can be helpful especially among like NICU moms and they can talk and see what they can talk about their symptoms what's going on things that they can do to help you know coping strategies but there's also resources that we can involve them with three two one go so resources are going to include like if it's socioeconomic status, like just support for money, um, car rides, getting to the hospital, stuff like that. Any type of treatments that we can avoid, we, we can provide them with that's going to make things a little bit easier for them. So another one that doesn't get its due diligence, it's one of the areas of research I kind of follow a little bit more closely, is this one that says paternal. So paternal postpartum depression. So this is with the dads. So rates are about 4 to 12% if mom has PPD. So these are fathers that usually are going to get symptoms that are similar to the mom. A lot of them are the same in terms of like disturbances and everything. I've never really heard of a psychosis reaching a dad. Um, because a lot of it's going to be transitioning and more issues with that than the bio, true biological problems. But there's also, there's always psychological risks with any of these parents. So with the dad though, their issues come from a different source really. So that first week he's got to take care of mom, he's got the baby, he has to take care of mom. Give her some hair. So baby's going to be you know, in the NICU, getting all this support. Mom's going to be over in the lead, um, postpartum floor, getting her care. And the dad's just going to be going back and forth, trying to provide updates. And then we have our, you know, extended family out here. Her mom's out there. Her dad's out there. Her cousin, uncle, everyone's got questions. They want to know what's going on. Why is the baby in the NICU? What's happening? And the dad can get a little overwhelmed. And it's hard for them to kind of deal with that. Um, there's also the issues where we have the um, traditional father roles where we're talking about the dad has to be the provider. So he has to go back to work soon. So he might only have you know, one, two, if if that, weeks of um, paternity leave. So there's a lot of just problems that the dads run into. Um, they're often on neglected groups. So it's always important to make sure you're included with them. And then since we have a baby in the NICU and dad's having to go back to work earlier, has to support the family, can't always be there. Uh, this creates a couple issues with bonding or has a potential to create issues with bonding. Also with future interpersonal relationships with the baby. Relationships. So definitely a problem in that group. And then all of this has this overreaching problem for dads, which we just simply call transition. Hit my buttons. Transition to fatherhood. And this process is long ongoing, but it really peaks about three to six months. When the mom's peaking a little bit early, dads are a little further behind because they have to have a lot of other stuff happen. So dad has a lot of challenges. Um, it's not a straightforward, easy process for him either, but a lot of the questions you might see are just going to be 
you know, just basics like that has symptoms and um, but that's all we really need to get into for this video. So we will get questions up to you shortly.